Dear participants of the section, Social and Cultural Processes, of uh, 21st April International Academic Conference on Economic and Social Development. It's a great pleasure to have you here with us. Now I'm honored to present Professor Michel Gelfand, an outstanding researcher in the field of social and cultural issues. We were expecting to meet Michel personally here in Russia this April, but uh, COVID-19 pandemic made it impossible. We are very grateful to Michel for her consent to give a honored lecture in an online format today. Michelle Gelfand is a distinguished university professor and professor of psychology at the University of Maryland, the past president of the International Association uh, for Conflict Management, past treasurer of the International Association for uh, Cross-Cultural Psychology, and co-founder of the Society for the Study of Cultural Evolution. Michelle Gelfand is uh, the founding uh, co-editor of the Advances in Culture and Psychology annual series and Frontiers of Culture and Psychology series. Her work has been published in outlets such as Science, Nature, Scientific Report, Nature, Human Behavior, uh, uh, the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology, American Psychologist, Journal of Cross-Cultural Psychology and many other reputable journals. She received many prestigious awards, uh, for instance, in uh, 2019, Outstanding Public Psychology hmm. Award and the Analyze Research Award from the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation, which was given only to seven scientists worldwide for outstanding contributions in their fields. Her work uh, that was published in Science was honored with the Gordon Allport Intergroup Relations Prize from the Society for uh, the Psychological Study of Social Issues. She was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in uh, 2019. Michelle was trained under the guidance of Harry Triandis, one of the father's founders of cross-cultural psychology, who reintroduced the tightness looseness construct. Michelle went further in the study of this concept within a larger ecocultural framework. Her most recent book, Rule Makers, Rule Breakers, How Tight and Loose Cultures Wire Our World, was published in 2018. This book summarizes her research on the concept of tightness looseness conducted in more than 50 countries over the past two decades. This book was also translated into Russian in uh, 2019 with the title In more details, Michelle will uncover this topic in her today's presentation called Secret Life of Social Norms. We want to ask everyone to follow several requirements so that we all could enjoy uh, the talk. Overall, we have about two hours. First, we will listen to the uh, speaker and uh, afterwards uh, we'll have some time for the discussion. We would ask you to mute your microphones during the speech. You can write your questions in the chat in Zoom or YouTube channel during the presentation. Please note that due to time constraint, the speaker will uh, answer not all the questions. We should inform you that, if, uh, that the event will be recorded. Among those who joined this section, okay. we have participants yes. uh, of uh, International April Conference, colleagues from Russian and foreign universities. Most of them are specialists in the fields of social and cultural research, psychologists, sociologists, anthropologists who study the secret life of culture and are looking forward to hearing about secret life of social norm. I invite Professor Gelfand to address the audience. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and um, put my presentation up. So I want to just mention that um, I really want to come to Moscow. And um, of course, as you mentioned, what's not possible, and I'm hoping that we'll be able to arrange it uh, sometime in the near future. 
Um, I want to dedicate this lecture to Harry Triandis, um, my mentor who passed away last year. And Harry was really what I would call, and I think others would agree, a humble giant. <laughs> he was a very special person, not just an incredible intellectual, but also um, his personhood lives on in, in all of us. Um, and I just want to mention uh, that Harry had three pieces of advice for his students and others. And one was to be passionate about what you do. And that for many of us in cross-cultural psychology is pretty easy because we love things, all things cultural. His second piece of advice was don't be afraid to be controversial. Uh, he was a very courageous person. And his third piece of advice, which was the most important, was don't take yourself too seriously. <laughs> so I just want to um, say that I'm honoring Harry uh, through this lecture and, and the book um, was dedicated to Harry as well as my father. So I want to start with a story about two fish and the fish are swimming along one morning and they pass by another fish who says to them, hey boys, how's the water? And they swim on and one looks at the other and says, what the heck is water? And this story is pretty simple, but it makes a profound point which is that sometimes the most important realities around us are the most difficult to see, the ones that we take for granted. And for fish, that's water. But for humans, that's culture. Culture is really a puzzle because it's omnipresent. It's all around us from the moment we wake up to the moment we go to sleep, but it's invisible. We don't really tend to notice it. But it's affecting everything from our politics to our parenting. And so we really need to know more about it. And that's where cross-cultural psychology really is um, a really incredibly important field to try to help to uncover the deeper codes that drive our behavior. What's interesting is that humans have accomplished many technical feats. We've put a man on the moon, we've wired the earth, we've discovered the laws of gravity. But what if we could discover more of the laws of culture? Then we might be able to build a world um, where we can get along a little bit better. So as a cross-cultural psychologist, I've been traveling around the world and trying to understand um, how cultures vary, why they vary, and their consequences for human groups. And so, for example, if you go around the world, you'll see many interesting contrasts. For example, in Singapore, which is called the fine country, there's many different punishments for lots of behaviors. Things like um, littering or spitting or not flushing the toilet in public or even walking naked in front of your curtains in Singapore could land you a fine. But take a short plane ride over to New Zealand and you'll see things like people walking barefoot in banks. You might see fences with many, many different bras. You might on college campuses witness people um, burning couches. Or in other contrast, take for example in Germany where people tend to wait patiently at the street corner even if there's no cars around. Whereas in my own home state of New York City, you see people constantly jaywalking, even with people, or even with kids in tow. And this device here on the left slide is something that's really interesting that's actually been developed in some cities in Germany to try to further incentivize people staying put on street corners. It's called street pong. And this person here is playing ping pong, electric ping pong with the person across the street and if you look at this technology, you'll see that it tells you when the light is gonna turn. And that again, helps people to stay put. On a more serious note, why is it that in some contexts, like in the Netherlands, we can openly smoke weed, whereas in other cultures, this might land you the death penalty. There's many, many other contrasts that we see around the world that maybe we take for granted. And the question is, what ties these examples together? And what I've been studying over the last 20 some years is the phenomenon of social norms. Social norms are these unwritten rules for behavior that sometimes get formalized into laws. And they're really important and they're really something that humans have developed and perfected. Um, compared to other species, we have an uncanny ability to develop, maintain, and enforce social rules. And in fact, if you think about it, we really couldn't survive without social norms. Just as a thought experiment, imagine waking up to a world where there are no social norms, where people drive on either side of the street and they don't pay attention to stop signs. Or imagine you're in a restaurant and people are stealing food off each other's plates and they're burping out loud 
and there's just total chaos. Or imagine you walk into an elevator and people are facing backwards and shaking their umbrellas all over each other. Or in this world, imagine that humans have sex in any place, on buses, in parks, in their offices. There's a reason why humans develop social norms so that we can avoid these kinds of chaotic scenarios. In a way, social norms help us to coordinate and predict each other's behaviors on an unprecedented level. In that sense, they're the glue that binds us together. And what I've been studying over some time is the idea that this glue varies around the world. Some cultures have very strong glue and others might have weaker glue, even if we all have social norms. And this is a distinction that's been referred to as the difference between tight and loose cultures. This was a construct that was pioneered by Pierre Chopelto in the late 60s and John Berry and his colleagues, and later discussed by Harry Triandis in his 1989 psychological review paper. And I've been trying to understand this distinction, and that's the focus of the talk today. Tight cultures have strict rules and strong punishments for, for, for deviance. Loose cultures, by contrast, have weaker rules, and they're more permissive. And I've been interested in understanding the dynamics of this construct. Um, and I'm gonna present to you today, this will be what we're gonna cover in this talk, is first of all, how can we think about modern nations? Do they differ on the strength of social norms on tight loose? Even though all nations have tight and loose domains, is it the case that some cultures veer tight and others veer loose? Is this construct different than others that we know about and they're important? Why do cultures vary on tight loose and what are the trade-offs? So that will be the beginning part of my talk. I also want to then talk about this, what I call a fractal pattern. Can we think about tight loose in terms of a microscope that we can zoom in and find variation in tight loose in other levels of analysis, like at the state level in the United States? Then I want to talk a little bit about the dynamics. This is not a static construct. How does it change? I'll then refer to research on the cross-cultural interface. How do we manage divides that might come up based on tight loose differences in expatriation contexts and mergers and acquisitions? And then I'm gonna ask you a question, which is what do you think is better? This is an age old debate. And finally, at the end of the talk, I'll talk about some data we have on tight loose as it pertains to COVID-19. So let me start with the first study that we did on this construct on tightness looseness. And we simply wanted to see, can we measure this construct? Is it different than other constructs? What are its uh, correlates? And why might these differences have evolved? This was a study done with many, many different colleagues of mine across different nations. And we chose these nations theoretically based on a theory we had about tightness and looseness that you will explore right now. As we we're collecting survey data among people around the world, we were also collecting data on ecological and historical factors in each country. We were also doing unobtrusive observations um, on city streets in different countries around the world. We were inspired by John Berry's ecological framework of culture, that cultural differences arise in part due to adaptations to their environment. And what we found in this study, I'll give the highlights, is that we could assess tightness looseness as a reliable and valid construct. Um, cultures like Japan and Singapore and China and to some extent, Germany and Austria tended to veer tighter. Cultures like New Zealand and Greece and the Netherlands and the US tended to veer looser. The construct was related to, but distinct from culture, constructs like collectivism. Uh, actually, as a very interesting story, Harry and I talked about the correct connection between collectivism and tightness, and he predicted that the correlation would be 0.4. And actually, when I looked at this data, it was remarkable that he was exactly correct. That's to say that tight cultures tend to be more collectivistic, but there's also variation on that correlation in the sense that there are tight cultures that are collectivistic and loose cultures that are individualistic, but there's also tight cultures that veer individualistic. In our data, those were cultures like Austria and Germany. There's also collectivist cultures that tend to be loose. In our data, that were places like Spain and Italy and Greece and Brazil. So you can think about that there's actually four quadrants we can explore in the connection between tightness and collectivism. Tightness was also not correlated with GDP. There are rich countries that are tight 
and poor countries that are tight. And likewise, there are rich countries that are loose and poor countries that are loose. So that's just to say that we can actually assess the construct and think about uh, how nations vary on this construct. If we zoom in um, to other data we collect in this project, we could see that tightness and looseness conferred what I call an openness versus order trade-off. So with a lot of different data, we could see that tight cultures had more order. They had lower crime and they had more monitoring in terms of um, police per capita. They also had more uniformity in terms of the clothes that people wear, or the cars that they drive. Even this, the clocks on city streets tend to be more in sync in tight cultures, according to our data. In loose cultures, the clocks say a lot of different times in city streets, and you're not entirely sure what time it is. Tight cultures also have a lot of self-control. If you live in a context where there are a lot of rules and potential punishments, you need to monitor your impulses more and control your behavior. And that has influences at a macro level on things like differences in debt and obesity and alcoholism. So tight cultures corner the market on order and loose cultures tend to struggle with order. They have higher crime, less uniformity and synchrony, and they have a host of self-regulation problems. But loose cultures corner the market on openness. In our data, you could see that people in loose cultures are much more tolerant of many different types of people, people from different races and religions, immigrants, and other stigmatized people. We showed this in a field experiment we did that was part of our Humboldt grant, where I sent RAs back to their home countries and we trained them in Bremen um, to go back and ask for directions to city streets or ask for help in stores. And there was a twist on this study. In one condition, I asked the students to wear fake facial warts that I bought them off the internet. And in another condition, I asked them to wear tattoos and nose rings and purple hair. And in another condition, they just wear their normal face. And they went back to their countries and asked for directions in city streets. And what we found was that there was no cultural differences when people were just wearing their face, their normal face. But when people were wearing these stigmatized identities, whether they were facial warts or they were tattoos, they got much more help in loose cultures. Loose cultures corner the market on openness in other ways. They tend to have more ideas and greater creativity, and they tend to be more open to change. So you could see here that while loose cultures corner the market on openness, tight cultures struggle with openness. So one question we had was what is related to these differences? Uh, what, why might countries veer tight or loose? And there was no difference, as I mentioned, in GDP. There was no common language or tradition or location that unified tight and loose cultures. But what we speculated and tested in this project was that there might be a really important difference between tight and loose cultures. And that has to do with the amount of threat that countries have. When you think about collective threat, you can think about mother nature and ecological threat. Things like how many times does a nation have to deal with very serious natural disasters or famines like Japan. But we could think about collective threat in terms of things like human threat. How many times has your nation been potentially invaded over the last hundred years? How densely populated is the country and potentially chaotic? How many pathogen outbreaks have been in a culture? So we can quantify these kinds of threats. And in this study, we actually measured how many times a, a nation was threatened by invasions over a hundred year period and population density as far back as 1500 and other types of threats. And we could see that controlling for different factors, we found a connection between population density, deprivation of food and scarcity, natural disasters, territorial threat, and pathogen prevalence having correlations with tightness. Again, not all cultures uh, that are tight uh, have threat, and not all loose cultures are an easy street. But we can think about the idea that maybe when you have collective threat, that it's functional to be tight, to evolve to be tight. And that's because when we have collective threat, we need strong rules to coordinate our behavior in order to survive. That's what norms do. They help us to coordinate and predict each other's behavior. And they also help keep humans from defecting and from doing uh, things that might make it difficult to survive under very serious threats. So this was a general pattern. We wanted to see whether this pattern is something we can see in other contexts. In recent years, I've been partnering 
with Carol Ember, who is heading the um, study of the human relation area files at Yale University. And we wanted to see, can we see the same pattern in pre-industrial societies? We picked up on where Pierre Topelto left off in the late 60s, and we coded ethnographies more directly for the degree to which norms constrain behavior and whether there's strong or weak punishments for deviance. These ethnographies have a rich amount of information. They have many uh, different um, sections on things like law and ethics in these societies, socialization from early infancy until later adulthood, gender, marriage, sexuality, and rituals. So we coded all of these domains for how much they were uh, reflected tightness and looseness. And what we could see is that with factor analysis, there was a strong unidimensional factor whereby in societies that had strict norms and punishments in law and ethics, they also tended to have them in these other domains. And you can see in this picture, just in general, the variation we can see all around the world in terms of pre-industrial societies on tight loose. Like the national data that I presented, we can also see similar types of patterns. Pre-industrial societies that had a lot of threat tended to veer tighter. They had higher population density, greater warfare, higher pathogens, and scarcity. And they also showed the same types of order openness trade-offs that I talked about earlier. What we wanted to try to do in this research program is then see, is this pattern of tight loose also something that can help us to understand variation at other levels of analysis? And so we turn to the United States, which has a lot of variability. Often we think about the US here in terms of something basically like red versus blue states. What we wanted to do in this paper is to actually code the United States at a level where we could see variation in tightness looseness. And this study, which was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, showed that the Southern states and the Midwest in the US tended to veer tighter. And this was both with archival data and with survey data. You can see a remarkable resemblance with this map of the United States and our tight loose scores with the amount of disasters that states have to face on a chronic basis. And so you can see here that the South and parts of the Midwest are heavily uh, burdened by natural disasters. They also have more food scarcity and pathogen outbreaks. When we looked at this data, we also wanted to see, again, can we see the order openness trade-off that comes with tight loose in the states? And we can see that with archival data that state tightness was associated with order. There were more people in tight states that scored high on personality conscientiousness. There were also more evidence of social organization in tight states. They had more law enforcement, less homelessness, and less divorce. They also tended to have more self-control. They had lower recreational drug use, less debt. They also were coded as being more polite states. My own beloved New York is actually one of the rudest states in the union, and it actually is one of the loosest. But as we mentioned earlier, state looseness also is associated with openness. There's more people in loose states that have higher unpersonality openness from the big five. They also tend to have higher creativity, more patents per capita, more foreign artists per capita, and they have higher equality and less bias. They have fewer um, discrimination claims and they have more minority owned businesses, even controlling for the number of minorities. They tend to be ruder states, but they are also rated as being more fun. And of course, there are loose states that have tight counties, and there are tight states that have loose counties. And in the book, Rule Makers or Breakers, I get into more details of those differences, as well as some of the founding conditions of the US, the bottom-up processes that might have also produced some of this variation. So, so far, I've been talking about tight loose at the state level in pre-industrial societies and its states. I wanna now get into some computational modeling that can get at this relationship with a more causal uh, structure because this is all correlational data. And we wanted to see, is there evidence that we can look at how tightness causes the evolution, uh, how threat causes the evolution of tightness. And here we turn to evolutionary game theory and how it can be integrated with cross-cultural psychology. Turns out it's a really fantastic intellectual marriage because evolutionary game theorists are interested in understanding how conditions affect the evolution of stable equilibria, whether they're norms or values or behaviors. Cross-cultural psychologists, 
inspired by the ecological foundations of culture models, are also interested in how these kinds of conditions affect the evolution of culture. So we actually have a win-win in studying uh, these processes together. And with Dana now at the University of Maryland and my other colleagues, we've been developing models, uh, computational models of culture. The advantages of these models is that they're at the right level of analysis in the sense that they're trying to understand cultural evolution. I'll present to you some priming studies also shortly that can get at individual level um, uh, affordances of threat. But this is actually something that helps us to get at the evolution of culture at the population level, even though the limitations, of course, are these are simulations. So in this model that I'll just briefly show you, we were interested in cooperation and punishment and its evolution. And in cooperation phase in this model, we had agents that cooperated with others who defected or were opportunistic, which just means that they took the reputation of their other agents into account in making their decisions. In stage two of this model, we had uh, agents that were responsible punishers, they punished those that defected. We had spiteful punishers that punished everybody. You might know some people like that. <laughs> we had antisocial punishers who punished cooperators, which has been shown to be a strategy that exists in some societies. We had agents that didn't punish at all. And the question in this model is, what, as threat increases in populations, which strategies persist? Which strategies can survive these kinds of contexts? And threat is operationalized in this model as a um, payoff deficit. In high context of threat, nations need to allocate their resources to dealing with the threat. And so the societies have uh, arguably lower payoffs. And so we ran many, many different simulations with very high threat to very low threat. I'm just gonna present to you what this model looks like. What we can see here is a graph of on the x-axis as threat is increasing, and on the y-axis, the proportion of strategies that actually are um, dominant in the population. And the red line here are defectors. And what you can see here is that as threat is increasing, defection, these agents are dying off in the population. The purple line and the, and the black line reflect cooperative strategies. You can see that as um, threat is increasing, that cooperation is enhanced. Also on the next slide, you can see that as cooperation is increasing, as threat is increasing, that responsible punishment is increasing and the other strategies are falling out of the populations. This is a way to look at how threat causes the evolution of cooperation and punishment at the population level. We can also see here in these models, a dramatic increase in threat or a decrease in threat in what happens. And what you could see is this follows the same kind of logic. At time 1000, we dramatically increase a threat in a population that has had little threat. And you can see that they actually become tighter in terms of cooperation and punishment. Before threat, you see uh, in low context of threat, you see lots of different strategies are viable. Likewise, when threat is suddenly decreasing in a population, we see that gradually uh, cooperation and punishment re get reduced. It takes longer actually for this to happen. There's some kind of asymmetry in these models. And this is something I'm gonna pick up on a little bit later when I show you some data on tight loose and COVID-19. But this is just to say that in cross-cultural psychology, what we've been taught is that we really need to use different methodologies to understand culture, whether it's field studies, experiments, or modeling, it helps us to understand uh, and replicate our findings across different methods. We've also done this at the individual level. We brought people into the lab in the paradigm we call ecological priming. And we can tell people that they're in context where there's high population density or that there's potential terrorism threats or potential disasters. And what we can see in these studies is that people in almost instantly desire greater tightness, at least temporarily when they're faced with these kinds of threats. And this suggests something really important that threats don't need to be real. Even when we activate them temporarily and tell people that there are imminent threats, they start to tighten. And they also start to show this order openness trade-off. They start to become a little bit more ethnocentric and less open. I wanna mention uh, before getting to some of the cultural interface data uh, that we've also applied the construct to try to understand election dynamics. And before the Trump election in the US, we had the hunch that one, one factor that might be causing the desire for Trump is the, the degree to which people are feeling threatened 
we did a study with um, 500 representative Americans about threat, tightness, and Trump. And we asked people how threatened they, feel, they felt about things like ISIS and about um, North Korea and about immigration. And we also asked them how much they felt the US needed stricter rules. And we found a connection between the extent to which people felt threatened and how much they wanted stricter rules and felt the US was too loose. And that in turn affected and was partially mediating their desire to vote for Trump. We've replicated this study also in, um, in France uh, in, a, in an op-ed that I wrote about um, in the conversation and Scientific American. In France also, people who felt very threatened felt that France needed to tighten up. And this in turn, in part, um, was related to their uh, desire to vote, vote for Le Pen in the primaries. Of course, it's also the case that leaders understand this psychology and they might use threat to try to tighten people up. And we have other data that I can talk about during our Q&A that talks about that um, dynamic. Okay, I wanna talk a little bit about managing tight and loose divides. What happens at the interface when people are interacting with people uh, that have been socialized with these different mindsets? First, we can think about just the phenomenon of, of global expatriation, which is a really phenomenally interesting area because as it turns out, a lot of times when we send people abroad to work in their assignments, we tend to send them based on their technical expertise, not based on their cultural intelligence. So we wanted to see what happens when people go, expatriates go to other cultures. And this was with Colleen Ward, a colleague of mine in New Zealand, and Nicholas Geertz in the UK, and Ren Lee, one of my students. And we studied international exchange students who were going to and from different host countries. And they participated in nine surveys over an 18 month period. And we can see in this data, which cultures are more difficult to adapt to, but we can also see which people are better able to adapt to different cultural contexts. So in a sense, this was a person culture match type of study. We're trying to understand um, both the interaction between where you're going and who you are from a personality point of view. And what we found was that going to a tighter culture resulted in having lower adaptation and more stress and anxiety. Interestingly, coming from a tighter culture to others, people had higher adaptation, perhaps because they were used to actually attending to the local context of norm strength. But we found something really interesting. We found that um, the people, sorry, I lost the slide there, the people who had higher agreeableness actually did just as well in tighter or looser cultures. It was the people who were very disagreeable that actually suffered very much when going to tighter cultures. And we have other data on other personality dimensions that also show interactions with tightness. That just suggests that when we're thinking about sending people abroad, we need to think about where they're going and who they are. We need to select people who are better matched to go to certain cultures or socialize them to understand the kind of problems and challenges they might face. I also think, although the data didn't suggest this, I'm still collecting more data with different samples, that it's also difficult to go to looser cultures for some people because looser cultures tend to be more chaotic and there's more ambiguity. And for people who are trained to have stricter uh, mindsets with rules, it might be uh, psychologically disturbing. But there may be, again, some people who are better able to manage that uncertainty, something we're looking at as we speak. Okay, I'm gonna talk about one last data point, which is on how do we think about mergers and acquisitions? Let's zoom into the organizational level of tightness and looseness, which is something that we were interested in. Just like nations and states, um, vary on tightness and looseness, so do organizations. And we can think about tightness and looseness in organizations in terms of the people, the practices, and the leadership in those organizations. Um, this is something that Benjamin Schneider, who is one of my mentors, has all talked about as attraction, selection, attrition types of processes. So tight organizations actually have a certain people, practices, and leadership DNA. They actually tend to have more rules and predictability, and they're more formal. They tend to have stronger socialization, like more training and more monitoring, and they have people who tend to be more prevention-focused and have higher impulse control. 
These kinds of cultures tend to live in certain industries. They live in manufacturing contexts, hospitals, airlines. And it makes sense because these are the kinds of contexts that have greater threat, greater coordination needs, and safety concerns. They also tend to be operative in organizations that have a lot of oversight and regulations, like the government and like the law. Loose organizations have a very different cultural DNA. They tend to be more flexible and more experimental, and they tend to be more informal. They have less monitoring, and they have people who are more promotion focused, more inclined to taking risks and have higher openness. They tend to live in industries uh, where there's not a lot of threat um, like startups and design and tech, where there's a lot of mobility and where there's a lot of diversity. So one question we had was what kind of leaders are operative in tight and loose cultures? And we see a big difference in the kinds of leaders that people prefer in tight and loose organizations around the world. We partnered with the Globe Research Project to connect our tight and loose data with their research that was answering the question are asking people to answer the question, what behaviors contribute to being an outstanding leader? Tight and loose cultures had different answers to this question. In tight cultures, controlling for lots of different factors, people desire leaders who are autonomous and independent. And in loose cultures, people desire <clears throat> leaders who are charismatic and more team oriented. So this is all to say <clears throat> that the people and the practices <clears throat> and the leadership that define tight and loose organizations is quite different. Of course, again, tight organizations might have some loose pockets and loose organizations might have some tight pockets, but we can try to use this lens to understand what kind of difficulties might people have when they're crossing organizational borders. This is what we see in mergers and acquisitions. And again, in this context, a lot of times organizations join forces for strategic advantages but they're not necessarily um, aware of the kind of cultural icebergs they might stumble into, particularly according to the tightness and looseness differences of their organizations. This was shown anecdotally, for example, with the Daimler Chrysler merger that happened, where it was initially thought of as a great marriage, but it turned into a really problematic merger in part due to um, differences in preferences for tight and loose norms at least from a cross-cultural psychology point of view, among other factors, of course. We wanted to try to quantify um, the price tag that goes along with tight and loose mergers. And this is a paper that we published in the Harvard Business Review, where we analyzed um, about 5,000 cross-border acquisitions over 30 countries over a, uh, a specific time frame. And we were interested in looking at, do big differences in tight and loose affect the performance of these mergers, looking at the ROA change over time. And we control for many different factors in the study, like the deal size and cultural variation on other dimensions, such as Hofstede's dimensions, and also um, who the uh, acquirer was, how much experience they had in these deals and so forth. And above and beyond these important factors, we did find that tightness differences made a big impact on ROA differences. One standard deviation change, for example, in tight loose, what resulted in uh, losses up to $245 million in net income. We also saw that these differences were even more pronounced in certain contexts in the CBA acquisitions. For example, when the tight culture was the acquirer, these differences were more pronounced. Also, these differences were more pronounced when um, the merger wasn't really in the, in, in the high tech industry as compared to manufacturing. So there's other moderators that we can see um, that affect these dynamics. But nevertheless, what we can see is that these matters differ. And what do we learn from this study is that we need to prepare to negotiate these differences. Uh, we need to, for example, first assess where is our organization on the degree of norm strength. And we need to assess another organization that we're thinking about partnering with for their levels of tight loose. And then we need to think about what are our priorities in terms of maintaining this level of tight loose and maybe being more flexible and adopting codes from other organizations. This is what we're calling the construct of tight loose ambidexterity, which just means that sometimes tight cultures might need to introduce some more discretion and flexibility into their cultural systems. This is what we call 
flexible tightness. But sometimes looser organizations might need to actually tighten up and have more structure. And we call this structured looseness. And this construct helps us to think about in a negotiation with another organization, or even in your own household, which I'll turn to toward the end of the talk, what might we, how might we might negotiate these differences? What's the most important to us in terms of maintaining the level of tightness we have, but where might we loosen up? Right now I'm doing some work with the US Navy, who arguably needs to be tight with the military, but wants to also figure out what domains might they insert some flexibility in. So we're developing new measures of tight loose that are in, within organizations, domains that we can then think about and uh, assess in order to then plan for how can we uh, actually engage in uh, concerted social change, cultural change. Okay, I'm getting toward the end of uh, my talk, but I wanna add, present a couple more things, and that is which is better. If I could see you, which I wish I could, I would have you raise your hand to tell me which do you think is better, tight or loose? And this, of course, is an age-old debate. Philosophers, political theorists, economists, and more recently, cross-cultural psychologists have been thinking about this question. Do we want society systems that emphasize freedom or looseness or rules and constraint? Of course, people like Plato, Confucius, Hobbes, all veered toward wanting constraint and rules. Hobbes, in particular, had a pretty a negative view of humans <laughs> functioning, thinking that we really need rules or we're gonna be destroying each other. Others like John Stuart Mill or Freud lean toward looseness. Freud himself thought that rules make us kind of neurotic. So the question is, what's the right answer? Is it tightness or looseness? And with Paul Bowski in Poland and my student, Jesse Harrington, we set out to address this. And we thought maybe the answer is neither. Maybe groups need to veer tight and loose for good reason, but maybe as the groups get either too tight or too loose, it could be actually maladaptive. If you're in a context that's really excessively loose, then there's just total unpredictability and chaos, and that is untenable. And on the flip side, if you're in a context that are too tight, this could be very repressive and, and also untenable. Actually, Durkheim talked about this in different terminology. He talked about country uh, societies that were had a prone to anemic suicide, anime meaning normlessness. But he also talked about fatalistic suicide in societies, which was in the context of having a lot of repression. We wanted to set out to try to actually show this empirically, and which is what we more broadly call the Goldilocks principle of tight loose. Goldilocks being this children's story that's been translated in many different languages, not too hot, not too cold, not too soft, not too hard. Again, with the recognition that countries need to veer tight or loose based on their ecologies, but the extremes start getting us into trouble. And what you could see here is some proof of concept for a study we published a few years ago. This just shows you um, on the x-axis tight loose scores from our original study and indications of various different health outcomes whether it is um, uh, depression or suicide, blood pressure or happiness. What you see in this data, and this is controlling for main effects and for GDP and other factors, is that the extremes have more negative outcomes. Both extreme tight and looseness had higher depression, had higher suicide, higher blood pressure, and lower happiness. We think that the Goldilocks principle actually applies beyond this level of analysis. So think about organizations. Again, they might need to veer tight or loose for good reasons. But we think, for example, even places like airlines um, that need to veer tight might sometimes become too tight. And this happened in the example in the US of United Airlines and a PR fiasco that happened some years ago. And again, United needs to veer tight. But what we argue was that they need to be uh, engaged in some flexible tightness to insert some discretion into that system so that people are not blindly following norms. On the flip side, think about places like Tesla or Uber in the United States. They need to veer loose, but arguably they were getting too loose and needed to insert some structure into those systems. Again, the tight loose Goldilocks principle. Even within our households, developmental psychologists would argue not using tight loose terminology, but in a similar conceptual frame, that extreme tightness in terms of parenting and extreme looseness can be problematic for kids. Some studies show that when parents 
actually are too helicopter-like and too much monitoring of children, or they're too laissez-faire that they have children who struggle. So this is just to say that we need to think about how we can negotiate norms. Humans invented norms. There are incredible invention and we can harness the power of norms and negotiate and change them as we needed to. We can identify contexts where we might need to tighten loose norms that have become maladaptive. Or we can identify contexts where we need to loosen tight norms. Of course, the devil here is in the details. <laughs> this is not easy work, but it's just a conceptual framing of the fact that um, we can start thinking about the dynamics and how we harness the power of norms in our everyday life. Okay, I'm just gonna end now talking about um, some data on tight loose and COVID-19. Um, this is work that's under review um, and I'm just gonna give you a sense of what the data look like. We wanted to see which nations are, help, are able to flatten the curve in the early stages of the pandemic. And we set out with the assumption that in these contexts where we have a pandemic, a global pandemic, that's spreading rapidly across the world, that there's a great need for coordination in these contexts to survive collective threats. Coordination, in our view, can come from two important sources that collectively would be very important in flattening curves. One source of um, coordination comes from strict norms, as we've been talking about and people who are following norms and new health behaviors like hand washing and social distancing and telling others who are not doing that, um, like our defectors and our models, that this is inappropriate. Another mechanism that's very critical at the societal level is government efficiency. Some governments are, have uh, this able ability to swiftly coordinate the private and public sector and have had uh, lower, uh, more success managing their spending. And what we argued in this context is that both strict norms and government efficiency in combination would be important for flattening curves and lowering death rates. In an op-ed that I wrote in early March in the Boston Globe, I was already getting concerned in the US that in particular in this country that sacrificing freedom for constraint is gonna be harder in terms of uh, norm abidance. And also in our current context in terms of efficiency that this also might be problematic. Um, in terms of flattening the curve. Um, and so in this op-ed, I tried to introduce uh, cross-cultural psychology to the general public. Uh, and I argued that to survive corona, the US has to tighten up, at least temporarily, and that it's not just about medicine, it's about culture. So we collected data on COVID-19 cases and, as well as death rates. We tried to collect data also on underreporting and other types of indicators because the data right now um, are of course tentative. We gather data on um, government efficiency. We also gather data on GDP and Gini and, and average age and other factors that would be important to control for in looking at the spread of the disease, including uh, population density, as well as those other factors. And what you can see in this graph are the curve rates controlling for all these factors. And what we see is that the nations in our data, at least in the early stages of the pandemic, that were best able to flatten the curve were those that had high government efficiency and that were socially tight. I wanna mention that this is not suggesting that uh, this is an authoritarian type of context. We actually control for authoritarianism and it, this, this is really about government efficiency. Um, and we also can see that in a computational model, something very similar. I'm just gonna orient you to this graph, which shows that over time, this is again, evolutionary game theory modeling, that tighter groups are able to more swiftly coordinate in the face of threat and have lower death rates. Um, we also, in this model, look at government efficiency and can see again that the groups that have high efficiency and high tightness are doing the best. What's really interesting in the data also though is that not all tight cultures are doing well. Tight cultures that have inefficient governments do poorly also. So I wanna just conclude by thanking you so much for having me here today. Um, and um, I'm really looking forward to your questions. <clears throat> I'll end on just mentioning that <clears throat> we also think, we can think about these contexts in terms of our own mind mindsets. We know when we think about cultural differences that the first place we should start is our own sense of self and how we've been socialized in terms of our proclivity towards tight and loose. This is what we call the tight loose mindset. 
And on my website, I have a quiz that's based on the science data that can help you assess where you fall on the continuum of, of tight, loose mindsets. Of course, we can all tighten and loosen in any particular context. When we're in libraries, we tend to tighten up. When we're in parties, we might be looser. But we each, because of our socialization and our experiences, have defaults on the tight, loose continuum. So it's helpful to think about why we might be <clears throat> where, why we might score the way we do on this, this mindset quiz and think about the people around us and why they might score differently on this. So in, in conclusion, once we think about these differences, we can then try to think about why they are scoring the way they do, cultivate empathy for others' mindsets, and also try to negotiate these in our daily lives. And I can give you some examples of that in my own family household to the extent that um, that's a, something that we want to talk about. So I think I will now conclude uh, and open it up for questions. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, dear Michelle. It was very interesting and you have a lot of questions in chat. And if you would like to look at them uh, by yourself and answer, some of them which you um, uh, find uh, the most maybe interesting, it will be great. Yeah, sure. So I, I mean, the, this is really interesting. Um, what, you know, one, one uh, question is, will COVID-19 make cultures more tight? And I think this is a great question. And, and my answer to that is, I think that that's correct. Um, in a pandemic, we need to have stricter rules um, when we're trying to um, deal with the disease. I think that what we're starting to get into um, all around the world is what I would call a tight, loose dance. As threat decreases, we should be loosening. Um, and you see that, um, you know, that's happening at least in some contexts around the world. But we might be prepared to, we might need to be prepared to tighten up once again in context where cases start rising again, when, when healthcare can't handle cases. So I think that we're gonna have to have this kind of ambidexterity to, th to deploy tightness and deploy looseness as needed. And we need clear leadership on this. We need people to understand that actually tightening up will save lives. And it doesn't mean that we can't also still maintain a loose spirit. For example, looseness is really helpful in creating technical innovations. We need looseness. We need looseness to create uh, social solutions, to be able to stay connected with each other. And we see that. We see an incredible amount of loose creativity in this pandemic. I mean, I could say as a university professor, quickly strict rules were put in force, but also we were able to innovate by using Zoom and other contexts to teach complicated classes. Mm -hmm. So I think we can see that, um, you know, especially with people who really are struggling with, um, with tightening, I think we need to help people to understand that it's temporary, that this is functional, it's adaptive, and that we don't need to lose our loose spirit. And, and this is particularly important in, I can say in my own country, because there's a really interesting irony, what we're trying to, starting to see here in the US, which is that it's the tighter states that tend to be more resistant to, um, to, to tightening up in this context. And my, um, my speculation is that they're following the wrong rules. In, in my country, at least, uh, we're getting really inconsistent and conflicted leadership around corona. And so in, in a healthy system, I think we need strong leadership that's consistent, that helps people to navigate this tight, loose dance that we will be, uh, I think, uh, need, needing to do for some time. Okay, there's a really great question. Um, do you think there are differences in the adaptation of migrants arriving from tight countries with different levels of cultural tightness? And this is a great question. And we actually have some data on that question. I think that, as I mentioned, uh, there's trade-offs with tightness and looseness. Tight cultures have a lot of order, but they tend to have less openness. And that applies to migrants. We can see that in our data published recently in PLOS One that um, in tighter cultures, people have much more negative attitudes toward migrants um, and uh, people from other countries. Also, we can see that sometimes people feel very threatened by migrants when in fact it's exaggerated threat. So recently I published an op-ed in the LA Times 
with data around uh, people's perceptions of migrants in the U.S., and in particular, uh, their estimates of how many illegal immigrants live in the United States. And their estimates, in large part, were really, really exaggerated. And that was also driving their perceptions of threat and also their desire for strong autocratic leaders. So part of what we have to deal with is negotiating the actual level of threat. There's also a lot of misconceptions around immigrants. For example, often it's thought that they're too loose. But in fact, studies show, coming out of economics, that in fact, uh, people, uh, immigrants tend to be more rule following. So um, this, I think, is a really important question for, um, for thinking about um, how we need to uh, help people who are traveling and migrating to different cultures. Um, so um, in your opinion, how tightness or looseness of a culture is related to creativity as an ability or even development of creative industries? This is a great question. And here again, I turn to the notion of Goldilocks because I think that when we think about innovation, innovation actually involves both tight and loose. So innovation requires creativity, requires that you can come up with new and exciting ideas. But innovation also requires scaling up. It requires a lot of coordination and implementation. So you can think about innovation being both about creativity and implementation. And some of our recent data, we can see that loose cultures have a lot of creativity, but tight cultures actually have a lot more implementation. So this suggests that actually we need both. We need organizations to be able to balance and bring together people who can actually be both creative and also can scale up. In the book, Startup Nation, which is a really interesting book about Israel, the authors talk about this, and they talk about how Israel, for example, is a very creative, loose context, but that it has a harder time scaling up. And they compare it to Singapore that has perhaps harder time coming up with new ideas, but that has a lot of strength in scaling up. So I think that's just to suggest that um, we need both in, in terms of that kind of innovation. Um, okay. Uh, you're tired. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm okay, actually. Um, um, yeah, but this question had to do with this uh, really strange phenomenon in the U.S., um, that the U.S. should tighten up to stop the spread of the virus. As an outsider, I see that tight states ease lockdowns. On the other hand, loose states take strict measures. Why is this happening? This is a million-dollar question. Uh, um, and it's, uh, you know, at first glance, it seemed that the loose states, well, I should just back up and say, the prediction from the models, from our data, is that, you know, all contexts will tighten up in response to corona, at least temporarily. But that um, in our case, we could see that in, in large part, the loose states could have early on had a lot of cases. So maybe that was an explanation, but that doesn't seem to now be the case. Uh, we see that corona spread all across the U.S. And we do see, as you're noticing, uh, in, in recent data, we can see a correlation between tightness at the state level and lower social distancing rates. Um, that's coming from um, measures of how much people were moving around and so forth. Um, and again, my, my hunch is that you know, tight states can, and tight contexts are norm following, but it really depends on the the particular norm that they're following in terms of how um, this will play out. And because these states tend to be um, aligned with and support Donald Trump, um, they tend to perhaps get that signaling from Trump that this is not so serious and that we should prioritize other goals like financial goals. So that's my, my, my hunch. And stay tuned because I think we'll have some more data um, to try to tease this out. You know, the question of are the tight states because they trust their leader, is that helping to explain why they're, in a sense, not following these, uh, these health behaviors and social distancing? And again, I don't want to imply that we should tighten up uh, permanently. I think that's where we need strong leadership to tell us when is it safe to actually loosen up a little bit. Um, I'm in a county, which is right outside of Washington, DC. We've been rated as an F the worst grade possible on what's happening in our county with corona. This is PG County. It also applies to Montgomery County here in the United States because we have a lot of 
uh, spread of the, of the virus and, um, and death rates. So we're on lockdown here. And I'm happy about that. <laughs> I have two teenagers. So trying to, you know, we're trying to negotiate all of us with our kids around these really difficult issues. And I'm happy about it because we're trying to flatten the curve. Once we do, when it's safe to kind of start to gradually loosen up, the models, you know, as I said, show that it takes longer to loosen when you've been tightened because perhaps from risk aversion. But there will be a time when we can loosen up and we have to calibrate that with the objective threat. And it's quite possible, as I mentioned, that we might need to also tighten up in this county in the fall or in the next spring. So it, it, that's kind of my sense is that uh, we need to be uh, really uh, calibrated and we need strong leadership for that. Um, okay, this question is how tight loose scores correlate with the elaboration of the state of the systems for the management of society like China? Um, this is a really interesting question. Um, you know, our data would, would suggest that tightness is correlated with um, more um, autocracy. Um, not all tight societies are autocratic, but certainly um, China has a very top-down system of, of tightness. Um, there, there's an interesting paper that came out recently that I wrote a commentary on that looks at tight loose in the 30 plus Chinese provinces. Um, and also looks at some of what explains some of the variation. And, and there's a lot of um, parallel types of findings, uh, but there's also some really interesting uh, differences or unique patterns in China. Uh, for example, this study um, by Roth and Chow and their colleagues uh, are finding that the more distant from Beijing a province is, with some exception, the winter. And the idea is that the more that you are out of the eye of the government, the more you can be loose. Also, they find really interesting data that it's the urban areas that are actually tighter than the rural areas, which is di different than what we find um, in other contexts. And it's possible that because there's an immense amount of, of migration into uh, the big cities in China, um, that um, there's a lot of top-down tightness that's being deployed in these areas in terms of monitoring uh, to avoid chaos. Um, so that's uh, just another context that we could see that, you know, there's some general patterns that we could see with tightness, but also some culture-specific patterns that we need to zoom in uh, to other contexts to see what is it that might uh, be different in that. Um, okay. Uh, Okay, so this is a great question. Is it possible to evaluate these norms at the individual level as individual traits and compare individuals? Do you have a question for the individual? So um, I wanna say that, and this is in the spirit of John Barry's work, of Harry's work, I, I've been reluctant to call people tight individuals or loose individuals. What I can say is that there are certain individual differences that are cultivated at the individual level to help people fit into the normative context and the ecological context that they've been socialized in. But there's not one trait. Um, so for example, in the, in the study that we did, we identified a cluster, a sway, a suite of individual differences that might be related to one's uh, ability to fit into strict or loose environments. And those included things like, how much are you high on self-monitoring? Do you notice rules? How much are you prepared to be uh, attentive to these rules in terms of prevention focus, wanting to minimize mistakes? And also, how much do you manage your impulses in terms of like self-regulation in order to fit into those contexts? And for example, all of us in some contexts have are high on these variables in libraries or in funerals or in symphonies, all sort of tight situations. Goffman called them tight actually, we probably are, our, our own levels of those traits are kind of increased. When we're in libraries or at a party, I mean, I mean we're in a public park or parties, uh, we probably have lower levels of those. And in a science study, we tried to show that with multi-level modeling, that those individual differences in self-monitoring, prevention focus, impulse control are related to higher order constructs of norms and the ecology of the nations. So that's just a long-winded way of saying that 
we can think about different levels of analysis and different constructs that are related to each other that are qualitatively distinct, but that are related empirically. So that's just to say that I think it's important to keep the levels of analysis distinct. Uh, the tight loose mindset quiz includes that those different constructs, includes attention to rules, impulse control, prevention focus um, that's based on the science data. And so you can see this at the individual level, but I would, I would um, suggest that we don't confound the levels of analysis so that we uh, remember how, um, how this is really more of a cultural system. Um, okay. Do you think collectivist cultures might handle COVID-19 better than an individual's culture since this requires a collective response? You know, it's a really interesting question, and I, I, not, I haven't seen any data on this yet. Um, I know that my colleague, Shinobu Kiriyama, has been arguing that, on the one hand, collectivist cultures, you know, might be more willing to, um, uh, to essentially, to wear fa face masks or, um, and, and do other types of behaviors that are healthy for corona. But on the other hand, um, he argues that there might be some kind of complacency in collectivist cultures, a sort of false sense of safety uh, that you might see. Um, there's also other complicated factors, um, like collectivist cultures that um, were, it might be that people struggle more with social distancing um, in terms of actually, you know, it might be easier for individuals and cultures to social distance um, that are used to having uh, less interaction so that that just suggests that it might be kind of um, multidimensional and, and and complicated. Um, okay. Thank you. Uh, probably John Bailey uh, uh, wants to ask something. John, are you with us? <laughs> oh, you're muted though. Uh, switch on your mic. Am I unmuted now? Uh, yep. Yeah. Well, Michelle, thank you very much. That was um, an excellent overview of um, both theory and findings and social relevance. Um, I was particularly interested in the question uh, about um, immigrants and their adaptability, uh, given where they come from and, and where they go to. Um, I don't have any uh, information on that from the studies that I'm aware of. However, um, you may remember, and you referred to the use of the tight, loose dimension uh, in my work uh, with indigenous peoples and um, their well-being. And what we found by sampling across a whole variety of indigenous societies that vary on many dimensions, including tightness, looseness was that the imposition of colonial rule, which is a very tight system uh, by the British and the French and possibly also Spanish, uh, those societies that were already hierarchically organized mm -hmm. with chiefs and aristocracies and privileged people right down to very uh, ordinary folks, uh, these societies had uh, much better uh, psychological and social welfare uh, during and after the colonial mm -hmm. process than those societies, mainly hunting and gathering societies mm -hmm. that were very loose, what Pelto calls acephalous, without yeah. permanent leadership, without permanent heads. So this suggests that um, mm -hmm. uh, in the migrant literature, we could also find a uh, mismatch mm -hmm. uh, and match uh, consequences. Those that are uh, used to hierarchy and yeah. control um, <clears throat> in their home societies might uh, manage better in societies to which they go, which are also tight. Uh, and conversely, those that come from loose societies may not, like the indigenous samples that I've talked about, uh, may not respond well to being told what to do by uh, hierarchical uh, figures or authorities in the society to which they migrate. Mm -hmm. That's well worth pursuing in, in future research. Yeah, this is 
incredibly interesting. Um, I, I've stumbled into recently this literature on what uh, biologists call these kind of evolutionary mismatches. Um, people have been studying this with animals um, in many ways where they have a certain you know, kind of well-being based on their match to their environment. And then that gets kind of disrupted either artificially from humans um, or some other change in the environment happens that they can't adapt to very easily. Um, and I think about, and I'm thinking now about how cross-cultural psychology should be thinking about these evolutionary mismatches also, because it strikes me that what you've just described is an, is an evolutionary mismatch where, where a, a culture is actually really thriving in its environment, like hunting and gatherers, and has this um, imposed mismatch that really affects its viability from an evolutionary point of view. It's the same case with, you know, even dealing with corona, I think. Um, you have a normal evolutionary process that might happen, like groups that will start to tighten, but you have <laughs> an input that's almost artificial, in our case, like from leaders, that basically um, messes up with that signal about the threat that would normally produce an, a, an adaption. And so I think, um, you know, I what's interesting is, you know, I've been, talking a lot with evolutionary, uh, with people who do work on cultural evolution. And I've been trying to merge what you did and what Harry was doing and what Whiting and Whiting was doing, you know, many, many decades ago, you didn't call it cultural evolution, um, but it's basically the eco-social model and Harry's analysis of subjective culture really are around issues of evolution, um, even if we didn't call it that. And I think that we also have the notion, like you just described, that there's these mismatches. And I, I think it's interesting to start thinking about that systematically in cross-cultural psychology, including the data you were just mentioning, because they can help us to identify how to avoid these mismatches, <laughs> or not avoid, but at least be aware of um, the fact that um, these mismatches can occur pretty frequently. So I'm, I'm trying to kind of connect the cross-cultural early work that you all did with the more recent kind of movement on cultural evolution, because I believe that that's what cross-cultural psychology has always been all about. It's what I, why I went to work with Harry in the first place also. Um, and um, it's just an incredibly, that incredible field. I feel very fortunate. I feel like I won the lottery becoming a cross-cultural psychologist. <laughs> you know, I think it's, I often think like the fact that we get paid to do this is kind of, you know, it's, it's remarkable. <laughs> uh, and, you know, I, I want to mention that I, I was actually stumbled into the field of cross-cultural psychology very serendipitously, like many people. I was at Colgate and I was pre-med and I discovered through Carolyn Keating in a cross-cultural human development class, um, she was working with uh, John, with uh, Marshall Siegel at the time at Syracuse, and she was doing some of this work with um, Siegel on visual illusions in Africa, you know, the classic Mueller liar illusion data. And I just couldn't believe that you can study this stuff. And, and of course, the psychology textbooks, because I was also in psychology, were really um, seemed to be based on you know, just Americans. And I thought that was really puzzling. So this has been happening you know, of course, this was in the late 80s for me. And Carolyn Keating um, said to me, I think you should talk to Richard Brislin, given your interest. I wound up switching out of pre-med and realizing maybe I should do something about uh, to study culture, but I wasn't sure what level of analysis to pursue, whether it was anthropology or international relations, or it didn't seem like there was any psychology departments that I could find that were giving degrees in cross-cultural psychology. In any event, I had this um, this uh, incredible conversation with Richard Brislin, who, who uh, was willing to talk to this undergraduate, you know, and he said, look, based on your interests, I think you should work with Harry Triandis. If you can get into University of Illinois, you should go work with Harry. And that was the end of the story. I went, when I got into to Champaign-Urbana, I wasn't too wild about going there from, you know, in the middle of nowhere, but it was really the best uh, decision ever. And at the time, I thought I'd become a cross-cultural trainer I was concerned about, you know, people like Baker and Aziz's negotiations and one, worrying about whether they understand cultural differences. And I eventually became academic, but um, 
on my honeymoon, I did visit um, Brislin at the East West Center <laughs> to thank him. Um, and I'm still in touch with him um, for you know, having just really serendipitously discovered this field. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, are there any other questions or oh, we'll uh, finish our uh, event? Thank you very much. Thank you, Michelle, for your uh, wonderful, exciting talk and uh, a lot of new information, uh, which uh, uh, maybe uh, is, is not published yet. And we hope anyway that you will come to Moscow uh, probably next year and we'll be happy to uh, see you and to listen to you. And uh, I hope our collaboration might be uh, fruitful in future. Thank you. Me too. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And I, I see you in Moscow, I hope. I'm looking forward. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Take Thanks care. Everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Great seeing you all again.